Welcome to Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. We're live on February 7th from the studios of WMNF Tampa. Today on Tuesday Cafe, we look at education in Florida. What concerns you about Florida schools? Is it books getting banned? The politicization, okay, I'll say that again, the politicization of school boards, vouchers for private schools. So we hope you call in and participate and let us know what you think about education in Florida. Of course, the numbers here are 813-239-9663. If you'd like to text, it's 813-433-0885. Please sign your name to that if you don't, if unless there's a reason you'd like to be anonymous. And if you want to email us, it's dj at wmnf.org. We're joined now by our two guests. Bianca Goolsby was a full-time teacher, but left to advocate for children and the disparities that many of them are facing all around Florida. Her platform called Teaching for the Culture reflects her passion about making sure each student has equal access to resources and a safe environment for them to learn. We're also joined by Reverend Russell Meyer, who is Executive Director of the Florida Council of Churches. Welcome back to the WMNF and Tuesday Cafe, Bianca and Russell. Thank you for having me. I appreciate both of you coming on, and I can't wait to have, have a great conversation about education with the two of you. So let's start with book banning. Um, I'm going to read uh, some information from the Tampa Bay Times about a Pinellas County issue. In late January, Pinellas County School District banned Tony Morrison's The Bluest Eyes from, from its high schools. Several students in the Palm Harbor University High School International Baccalaureate Program are asking the Pinellas County School District to allow the books, the book to be put back in their advanced literature class. The Tampa Bay Times reports their principal banned the book after a review that was prompted by a parent who complained that the book contained scenes of a father raping his 11-year-old daughter. The district later removed it from all county high schools. The students say they met with district officials to ask questions after the book was banned from the class. Officials removed it without following a formal procedure that was described in school board policy, and at least one board member and the Pinellas Teachers Union are questioning that decision. So that's one of the book banning uh, issues that we're going to talk about on this uh, program today. Do either of you have thoughts about this specific case, specifically about Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, or about book banning in general? Well, let me just say, uh, book banning is one of the worst ideas in um, political history. Uh, it has a long pedigree. Um, at different times, uh, the church in particular has um, uh, promulgated book banning. I mean, I'm a Lutheran pastor, so at one time at the Protestant Reformation, uh, there was a burning of books when they were first being created. Um, yeah, when uh, when the church and, and I'm speaking in a in a non-denominational kind of way, I'm just speaking about the power of uh, Euro Christianity in the world. When when the when the church went to Mexico, they they burned all of the literature of the Aztecs, and and there's vital information that we lost there. There was a lot of book banning that was done in the Middle Ages, and if it hadn't been for the libraries in Africa, we wouldn't even know Aristotle and much of Plato and a lot of the Greek uh, folk, uh, uh, Greek uh, literature and philosophers that we have today. So it's been it's been uh, the targets of book banning that's kept knowledge alive along the way. And so what we see happening right now in our political process is a very very old. Um, attack upon knowledge and truth and uh, done in the name of protecting our children by people who really aren't not interested in our children. They're interested in political fodder. And so the very concept of burning books, I believe is about as inhumane and unhuman and um, I would dare say un-American, though it's true, <laughs> if we look at American history, it has its warts and its ugly sides, and they want to hide that. That's the point. They want to hide from public view uh, the warts of America, and we cannot properly educate all of our children if, unless we can see both the beauty of our nation as well as its ugliness. Bianca, can you weigh in on book banning? 
Absolutely. So this past weekend, my wife hosted an education town hall, which people came to talk about just what we're talking about now, the state of public education in particular. And we had school board member Caprice Edmond that attended and actually talked about this particular situation. And all my comments are going to be is, I hope that Pinellas County Schools is listening, that if you are going to follow procedures, it needs to be done with fidelity. And there needs to be accountability, transparency, and integrity when we are having these book bans, because what's happening is we have selective outrage and participation. And so if we're going to protect our children, we also need to protect them from the internet that they have access to and the apps that our children are participating in. But also, if we're going to talk about certain books, we need to look at all the books if we're if we're going to really talk about it. And I, I just really think that this is all just um, noise and distractions on the real issue, which is the underfunding of public education, right. particularly with HB1 that's coming down the pipeline. Right. And be rest assured, we will definitely talk about funding and especially about HB1 during this show. I want to point out to people that that was Bianca Goolsby, an education advocate with Teaching for the Culture. And we are also speaking with Reverend Russell Meyer, Executive Director of the Florida Council of Churches. I'm Sean Canan. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe from the studios of WMNF Tampa. And we're talking about education in Florida. And Bianca, earlier in your answer, you mentioned your wife. And so I should point out to people that your wife is Representative Michelle Rayner Goolsby, who's a Democratic House representative in the state of Florida. And yeah, we covered that that forum um, to talk about it, education issues in, in Florida. So you can find information about that on our website, WMNF.org. Well, it's not just in Pinellas County where books are being banned. Teachers in Manatee County were asked to cover their bookshelves so they didn't risk violating the law. What kind of message does that send? It sends a message that we are just not really focused on the issue. The way that our educators have to literally cover up their bookshelves, I, the photos that are on social media is just wild to see because we are shielding books away from our children. But have we even paid attention to our literacy rate? Have we paid attention to the latest FSA data where most of our children are not even reading on grade level? So I just find all of this banter, just selective outrage and participation because our kids are not even reading on grade level in the state of Florida. So what are we going to do to address that? Absolutely, uh, Bianca. Um, she says it so well. Uh, how can you teach reading if you don't have books in the classroom? And teachers across the state in, in almost every district, every district I'm aware of, have, have been told to cover up their books. Many teachers buy books out of their own personal funds in order to enrich the education because we're so underfunded in our schools, right? And so they're supposed to teach reading, but they can't use literature to teach reading. Uh, so uh, this, and, and they've been told that until a title has been approved by the district. They risk felony prosecution for letting children see it. Uh, this is crazy. And it's the craziness and the cruelty that seems to be the point right now. It's, it's creating chaos and the chaos is intentional. It, it's a political theory that comes out of Eastern Europe, about uh, how to take control of a country. So the chaos is, a, is, is part of the point. And the sad point is, I think some of the people who have been um, recruited to make these complaints about literature really haven't done their homework on what's being asked of them. Before we move away from book bans to other parts of education, it, let's move down to Sarasota because we're going to hear a story here about the Sarasota School Board is scheduled to decide today on whether to ban a book about anti-racism from school libraries. So here's a story from Carrie Sheridan who reports the challenge is the first of its kind in Sarasota against a book that's not used for classroom instruction. The book in question is called Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi. The challenge came in May last year from the mother of a Venice middle school student. 
Her complaint alleges that the book teaches that all white people are inherently racist and that allowing it in schools is akin to allowing books that support Nazi ideology. A review committee comprised of media specialists, school principals, teachers, and parents ruled in November that the book does not violate Florida laws. The committee recommended it stay available in middle and high school libraries, while the parent wants it removed from all school libraries. The school board meets Tuesday at noon to hear more and decide. I'm Carrie Sheridan in Sarasota. So, Bianca, I'd like your uh, your uh, response to that. I, I've read that book. It's a fantastic book by Ibram X. Kennedy. I I, I wish that that my uh, daughter would read it. Uh, I wish that all students would read it. Uh, it's a fantastic book by Ibram X. Kennedy. And the, we heard there that um, that it, it, it's equated. It's it'd be similar to having a book about a, by a Nazi. What's going on there, Bianca? I just keep going back to selective outrage and participation. There, there's just no words that I can accurately say on the radio that will describe my feeling about this. I just think that we have just been so politicized. We have been using social media as echo, um, echo chambers. We are just not thinking intentionally when we are reading books and the actual overall message of these books. And so I just really pray for our nation and I really pray for the individuals making these decisions, but I, 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 I'm just mind blown at the way that these conversations have continued to just plague our nation where I just, I just don't see us moving forward. I see us going backwards. Dr. Meyer. Well, um, it's unfortunate that um, what are obvious lies and misrepresentations are being given uh, a court of of judgment uh you know if if they brought these charges to an actual court um they would be thrown out not only as frivolous but they would be held in contempt for wasting the court's time unfortunately we don't have those kinds of strict legal standards when we go before a district boards and what's the, the, these accusations are actually projections of what they themselves are doing um it it if you look at the practices of national socialism in germany in the 30s and 40s these are the very things that they were doing in in trying to throw out literature and, and artists and performers and etc not only that national socialism studied uh, how enslavement was enacted in american laws and then tried to place that into german laws and 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 what stan does uh, what what this book does is expose that it it exposes that kind of history and so this is telling a lie to uh, cover up your own misdeeds. And I wish that district school boards had the kind of strict legalities and not having to entertain these kinds of opinions. Our guests are Dr. Reverend Russell Meyer, Executive Director of the Florida Council of Churches, and Bianca Goolsby, an education advocate with Teaching for the Culture. I'm Sean Canaan. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we're talking about education in Florida Steve writes in and correctly uh, corrects my pronunciation. It's Ibram X. Kendi. I, I mispronounced it apparently when, when I was uh, winging it a minute ago. And Jane writes in, she says, I believe that banning books actually brings attention to that book and increases interest and sales. So what do you guys think about that, that point that Jane writes about? We have seen where banned books have accelerated in their price and the, also the number of sales. So yes, it's drawing attention to it, but I just don't think that this is the way that we should draw attention to it. So it goes back to, again, selective outrage and participation. Right. Uh, uh, you know, unintended consequences. Uh, and, and so what one sees is this kind of political fodder that's being thrown up to create chaos really um, doesn't isn't even good a checkers play. I mean, they could, they don't um, uh, see what kind of uh, dust storm that they create by nonsense. 
And uh, I, I just hope more people are willing to show up and say that's nonsense. We, that's not how we want to uh, run our schools. It's not how we want to conduct ourselves in the public forum. Um, so, uh, but there's there's deep pockets and dark money that's pushing this stuff for a larger political objectives. And and as long as they can distract from these other kinds of larger uh, political objectives, we're not spending the energy on creating a strong and prosperous democracy. And that's what we really need to be focused on. All of our children need to know this various literature. It doesn't mean they, ex they automatically believe the opinions they read. They need to be able to understand the various opinions that are out there and develop their own critical capacities for judgment so they can operate successfully in the world. That's what's being removed from our children. We should be very clear that when we start banning these books that people don't like, what they're saying is you can't know that opinion, you can't study that opinion, you can't form judgments of that opinion, you cannot have judgments of your own. So let's be very clear. They're saying to our children that our children should not be taught to think. Well, let's move on from banning books for a moment here and talk about something that you know, I think a lot of people are going to find equally alarming, if not worse. A proposed draft of a physical education form in Florida could require all high school student athletes to disclose information regarding their menstrual history. That's already drawing pushback from opponents who say the measure would harm students. The Palm Beach Post reports that the draft published last month by the Florida High School Athletic Association proposes making currently optional questions regarding a student's menstrual cycle mandatory. If it's approved, the form would ask students if they've had a menstrual cycle, and if so, at what age they had their first menstrual period, their most recent menstrual period, and how many periods the student has had in the past 12 months. The president of PRISM, a South Florida nonprofit organization that provides sexual health information to LGBTQ plus youth, told the Miami Herald, this is clearly an effort to further stigmatize and demonize transgender people in sports, and it's meant to further exclude people who are not assigned female at birth in girls' sports. Well, you know, I when I started thinking about a, a show about education in Florida, it's possible that the last thing I thought about that we need to talk about is asking high school students about their menstrual periods. Uh, maybe I'll go first to Bianca for this one. Your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that we continue to cause issues that were non-issues to begin with. There were policies in place to protect people playing sports before all of these new proposals started to come into play. Why we're asking children these questions, why are we entertaining this is beyond me. I've just never thought in my lifetime that I would have to have a conversation with adults about why children need to fill out a form identifying all the times that they've had their menstrual cycle. <laughs> I'm just really sad at, at the state of education right now. I just don't understand why we are doing what we're doing and saying that it's for the betterment of our children because it's not. The receipts don't show that. The receipts show that this is providing anxiety. This is adding chaos. This is adding more steps to a process that was already well-developed before more people decided to put their thoughts and opinions into it. So I don't know what else to say other than I hope people are listening. I hope people are paying attention and I hope that they are mobilized to make action, to make phone calls, to do something, to encourage our legislators to be intentional with what they're deciding to do, because this is not it at all. Oh, I totally agree with Bianca on it on this and i have two granddaughters who are very athletic they will be playing sports i mean their father's a tennis coach right um and i i want to make certain this does not exist um, when they get um old enough to play uh um uh sports but let's put this 
let's let's have fair ground. Let's have all the boys sign forms that talk about when they ejaculate. Let's be clear about what's going on here, right? So the, the problem that we have in this society is we want to treat, um, you know, uh, one gender with absolute privilege, unquestionably, and other genders we want to question every which way. And that, that is an insult to humanity. That, that, that is a repudiation of what we teach, that all people are made in the image of God. And so if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander, right? So let's see, let's see a form proposed that all boys have to announce when they started ejaculating, because that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about reproductive organs. So when did they start ejaculating? How often do they ejaculate? Do they ejaculate themselves, right? So I mean, why are we going down this? Um, I hope the federal government steps in and declares that this is a violation of HIPAA rules. Um, uh, but you know, I'm not, I'm not holding out hope. Uh, this is so offensive. Uh, I hope that uh, as this spreads across national news, the whole country rises up in disgust and rejection of this idea. Um, our children uh, deserve to be protected at what is the most vulnerable point in their life to date, in their transition, in um, their own sexuality is the most vulnerable point in the life of a child. And that we are, we are making this uh, a, a point of political attack. Nobody deserves to be in office who suggests this idea, nobody. Our guests are Reverend Russell Meyer, Executive Director of the Florida Council of Churches. We are also speaking with Bianca Goolsby, an education advocate with Teaching for the Culture. I'm Sean Canaan. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe, broadcasting live on February 7th from the studios of WMNF Tampa. And you can call in with, with by calling 813-239-9663. You can also email dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433. Charles in Tampa writes, he loves the term selective outrage. The only modification I might suggest would be to add the word manufactured because all this outrage is entirely manufactured. That's yeah. the thoughts from Charles in Tampa. Also, Karen in Dunedin writes that she just requested the bluest eyes from the library, but it's still wrong to ban books, she says. She says, if a parent has a problem with a book, can't they just offer that child an alternative? So um, <laughs> let me read one more email before we move on. Uh, DeMarco writes in, the privatization of public schools is an idea that almost that is almost as stupid as it is greedy. It's throwing our kids to the wolves. So we haven't even really talked yet about the privatization of public schools. I'm sure we will. Um, and DeMarco goes on to say, I saw a teacher on the news saying that Ron D. Fascist, is, that's how he put it, is making her heart hurt every day. And he calls that fascism and that our governor is a fascist. So uh, thank you for those emails. If you'd like to weigh in, please give us a call, 813-239-9663. We do have J John on the line in Sefner. So let's hear what John has to say. Hi, John. John, are you there? Let me, uh... Ah, there you go. You there? Yes, I am. All right. What would you like to say? Well, uh, just to brief snapshot of education in Hillsborough County um, and how we're back to where we seems like we're almost back to where we were before I started school. Um, when I started school, it was the first year of integration in Hillsborough County, and I went to Sonoda Sassa Elementary. My three older brothers graduated from high schools in King, but they weren't integrated, so my view was a little bit different. Um, graduated in 76, and things were really it was, it was a little bit of a tough transition, but things were going very well, um, in my mind at least. And here I turn around twice, and all of a sudden I'm 65, and it's like we're back to where we were when I was watching the news as a young kid growing up with all these different groups getting attacked by a group. And um, y'all touched on a little bit. This is more broad than just gay uh, and race. It's class. It's class warfare. 
and our governor and to a large degree our legislature in Florida is bought into it and and there's 49 other states at least or many other states that should be looking at Florida and Florida's educational system as the example of what not to do mm-hmm. and I thank you everyone for their comments and I appreciate WMNF um, bringing up um, some points that you're never ever going to see or hear on um, conventional media and I'll shut up John, thanks so much for calling in. I appreciate you calling in. And I'm uh, wondering if our, our guests can weigh in on that, especially on the class issue. Reverend Meyer. Um, well, uh, one of the concepts they want to ban in public schools is the concept of intersectionality. Um, and uh, it's 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 very hard when you look at the data to separate uh, class and race in neat categories. Um, And so, yes, there's a class side of it. Um, And if you just, if you just look at basic economic um, uh, data put out by the United Way, I hope that's a credible trusted source, almost one out of two households can barely make ends meet at the end of the month. Um, and then you start drilling down and you look at what their wages are and, and then what the demographics of those households are. And it becomes um, a, a gloomier and gloomier prospect depending on, on your skin color, right? Um, and that's all the outcomes of public policies. Um, and and uh, the the folks who've been running Florida for a long time know that, and they are intentionally doubling down on the policies. I, I want to go back to what the um, caller was just talking about in his memory of where we started, um, uh, which is uh, 1954, uh, Brown versus the Board of Topeka, the decision that um, separate is not equal, that public schools uh, should be desegregated. And what we're seeing right now um, in the privatization of public schools is is two things. One is to convince parents by way of choice to surrender their child's civil rights. I just want you to think about that. As a parent, why would I surrender my child's civil rights? But that is what happens when you take voucher money and you leave the public school system, you go to a private school, you are giving up your child's civil rights to a high quality public education. Um, But secondly, in in then doing that, education becomes resegregated and the data shows this, that uh, private schools and to some extent even charter schools end up resegregating education and reinstalling the doctrine of um, separate but not equal. Um, and, and that is being done when uh, private investors on the outside are making money off of the privatization of schools. So uh, there is a very much a real sense in which we are turning the clock back fast in Florida, and it does have race and class marked all over it. Bianca Goolsby, more on the intersectionality aspect and also about funding. Yeah, so we see that Florida has been on national news about the state of education. Education is a great equalizer. So now we understand why there's a war on education. We also understand that the failure of education is big business. And the failure is actually the reason why there is so much money that is being pumped through the system. So there's a profit in the problem. So until we address that problem and the profit that's being made from that problem, there are so many unfunded mandates that are in place where it's forcing some of our districts not to be able to meet their operation expenses. We're talking about Hillsborough, for example, they are still not paying their educators what they've promised to pay because they were at a deficit and is still under state oversight due to their finances. So 
we have to look at all of it. We need to follow the money. We need to hold people accountable and we need to demand more because our children deserve better. That's Bianca Goolsby, an education advocate with Teaching for the Culture. And Reverend Russell Myers, our other guest, he's executive director of the Florida Council of Churches. I'm Sean Canan. It's 1036 in the morning here on February 7th, and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe coming to you live from the studios of WMNF Tampa. The uh, Before we go to another phone call, uh, someone in the 863 area code, so maybe Polk County is asking, how is this form being framed in the right-wing media? Oh, sorry, you did give um, your name there, Louie Louie in Lakeland. And so um, I think the, the form that they're talking about there is about uh, asking students for their menstrual history. And we're going to go to a phone call about that in just a second. But I think the the, the point that um, I don't know about the right wing media or, or any different type of media, but I think that the reason that the form is being suggested as happening is because there's a, a group of people who are concerned that trans women are participating in, sorry, I should say trans girls are trans, are participating in girls sports in, in high schools. And, and that is a concern to them. And they think that if they fill out this form, that they'll crack down on, on that. Um, that's my understanding of why it's even an issue. But of course, we've we've talked about the concerns, and we have someone in St. Petersburg, Kimberly, who wants to weigh in on this issue. So, hi, Kimberly. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, having been a an athlete as a young woman, um, I think you know this idea that um, somehow boys can magically become girls and therefore don't have any sort of advantage when it comes to um, sports. I mean, I just, you know, that just is, um, you know, that, that kind of notion um, to me is really magical thinking. Uh, having actually been a girl uh, before girl sports was even a thing. And, uh, you know, I really think that Title IX and everything was designed to to protect girls and women and give them opportunities. And, you know, I appreciate that there are, are some, some boys out there that are, you know, obviously confused about their bodies. And, you know, there is a, uh, a well-financed uh, school curriculum, as, as I'm sure you're aware, with, uh, I think it starts in kindergarten in most states, um, that basically, you know, puts this notion into, you know, kids' heads. I'm actually not familiar with that, Kimberly. Let's see if our, our guests who know about the education system can tell us about that. So there's a lot there, Bianca. Um, uh, Kimberly is suggesting that there's a, a curriculum to put the notion of um, of people becoming, you know, of people being trans in the, the school curriculum beginning at kindergarten. That doesn't sound right to me, but I'm not as an education expert like you are. So no, I, I haven't personally seen it. There's a quote that I live by and it's people lie, receipts don't. So if there are any receipts that can show that, I would love to see it. I haven't seen any. So that's my comment to that. And this whole idea that um, that there are boys becoming, uh, becoming girls in order to play uh, girls sports in high school. I, I just, I don't, I think that even just the phrasing of that question is, is <laughs> I, I can't answer that because the way that gender is so fluid and the way that we as humans have decided to frame things as so concrete and we have selective outrage on what's concrete and what's not like that is the root of, of this. I don't I don't have any comments uh, about that in particular. I just want people to understand that when they come on public platforms to speak mm -hmm. on issues, it's really important that they have the receipts to back up what they say, because that's how misinformation spreads. That's how fear and chaos spreads. And that is not what we need right now. Russell Meyer. Well, um, Bianca talked about the fluidity of human sexuality and it exists in a long continuum. And for, for a long time, we wanted to take the idealized ends and say, that's where everybody is. But we all know that's not where everybody is. 
And for, uh, for a long time, we created laws based upon the idealized side in Western society, but other societies never that. Uh, other societies always recognize the fluidity of human sexuality. And so we're now at the point where because of how we've come to learn from others than ourselves, and we're not just looking in the mirror and saying all knowledge is already present in us, we're learning from others, we're beginning to understand human sexuality in much uh, greater depth and breadth than we ever did beforehand. Um, and so the idealizing uh, boys and girls doesn't serve any single child, doesn't serve any boy or any girl or any trans child. It, it just simply doesn't. It does them harm when we do that. Um, it, it makes them try and become something that they are not already. So we all live on this continuum and becoming uh, gaining the capacity to understand where you are on that continuum, continuum and be able to relate to other people wherever they are on the continuum, that's called maturity. And that's, I think, what we want to teach our children along the way. And so whatever literature is in the public school is all about teaching the children um, the maturity of respect and dignity of the other person, right? Now, to the question of sports. The statistical probabilities of how many um, trans girls would actually be playing sports in Florida high schools um, is what, maybe 12 a year? Uh, or that's the number I heard at a committee testimony a year or so ago. So we're talking about forcing a million students to go through deep personal um, invasion of privacy for uh, an, a, a fractional possibility, this is scapegoating. The, the, this is the worst kind of societal move against some of the most vulnerable people in society. One has to understand that when a, when a child um, uh, comes out as not being um, a male or female or Homo uh, heterosexual normativity, when, when they come out as being different than most of the other people around them, uh, they, are, they are extremely, extremely vulnerable and psychologically, emotionally, um, physically vulnerable. The kinds of harm that are done um, to children and youth because they are coming to understand their um, sexuality is of great concern to me. Most of the homeless youth on our streets in Florida are children who've been kicked out of their own home by their own parents because they're coming to terms with where they are on the continuum of human sexuality. We ought to have deeper compassion, greater empathy for these children. And the fact that we're putting policy into place that says there's no role of com for compassion, there's no role for empathy, there's no role for understanding here, you are going to fit in this category or that category, no matter who you are. Um, that's not just an injustice. That's a crime and a sin against our children in, in my book. That's Reverend Russell Meyer, Executive Director of the Florida Council of Churches. Our other guest is Bianca Goolsby, an education advocate with Teaching for the Culture. I'm Sean Canaan. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We're talking about education in Florida. And uh, let me read an email or two and go, go back to the, uh, to the phones. Thanks for your phone call, Kimberly. Uh, Jerome writes, it feels like there's a division being enlarged between traditionalists and progressives, for lack of better terms, with the goal of creating private schools. Would funding public, would public funding end if the system goes private? So maybe before we go to the, um, to the phones, we can answer that question from Jerome. What would happen if more and more people uh, go through private education and what will happen to the public funding of public education? So with HB1 in particular, the way that the bill is structured, it will allow more people to have access to this program where they're able to use taxpayer money to fund private homeschooling and other choices. 
The root issue here is that we've created additional systems without addressing the primary and main system, which is public education. So we are highlighting all the choices that we have. And I'm all for choice. I believe that everyone should have a choice. However, public education should be the premier choice since the taxpayers are paying and funding that system. And so I don't like the argument that people have where they want to have public versus charter and public versus private and public versus homeschool because that's not the argument and should not be the argument. A child's learning environment is going to work what's best for them. The issue here is when we have students that go to a charter school or go to a private school and the money goes to that private school, but for whatever reason, they go back to public school, that money does not follow that child. So it leaves the school, the public school with a deficit and we can't continue to create deficits in our public school thinking that we're going to have some magical outcome that our children will be reading on grade level right right so when the brown decision came down um uh the economists suggested privatizing education and we have to understand private privatizing education is the way to undo civil rights. Um, and when you look at the case of Florida in particular, Florida is dead last in per capita income expenditure on public education. Uh, Nebraska and New York spend almost twice as much per capita income on public education, that's red and blue states, than what Florida does. Florida's basic issue in education right now is we're only spending 50 cents on the dollar that it costs. So when a parent chooses to take the uh, take the public money and go for a private education, the, the business model for schools is the same business models for colleges and universities. The eight to $10,000, depending upon uh, what your child's needs are, are not enough for what, what uh, real market-based uh, tuition actually is. So uh, when you take that money out of the public schools, you then have to add to it, right? And, and we're preying on uh, families that are already distressed because of economics or uh, health care needs. They don't have the extra money. They can't continue to be in those situations. So they do have to come back to the public school systems and the money's been drained out along the way. So the first thing that the legislature should do is double what they're putting into education. And you know what? We got $17 billion sitting in the bank. They could do it tomorrow, right? So let's talk first of all about adequately funding education. We can then argue about where your child needs to have the best education. But the history of where we got to where we are right now is that uh, Jeb Bush and when he was governor started saying, let's take disability students out, give them a scholarship. We need to understand that the civil rights of disability students weren't being met. And, and the cheapest way for the state to get around their civil rights was to push them out of the system. And, and the scholarships that were given were inadequate for meeting their educational needs. And now we continue to build upon that. So choice really is a lie to parents about what actually happens with their child's education when they take them out of the public school system. And I just wish we could tell the truth uh, about what actually happens when these things occur. But we have these political um, uh, jingoisms that get people excited, um, but at the end of the day end up hurting not only their own households, but they also end up, end up hurting the rest of society. David writes in, he wants to know your take, Reverend Meyer, on Step Up for Students and their private school scholarships. David goes on to say, I know that several black and brown ministers have come on board to support the Step Up program in recent years. Many pastors have seen positive results and outcomes from it among disadvantaged and vulnerable children. Well, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I don't, uh, my policy is based on data, not anecdote. 
And so any given, you know, I could tell you a success story in any situation because, you know, human beings are wonderful, resilient creatures and they can make any opportunity come out of nothing, right? Because God's given us that capacity. So I'm not looking at any one particular story as whether it's successful or not. I'm looking at the whole, right? And um, on the whole, let's look at it. Step Up for Success has become something like the seventh largest a nonprofit in the United States in the time that it has existed. Um, it, it is now, it, it gets to keep 3% of all the tax deferred money that goes into these scholarships. It is now a $300 million a year enterprise that they get to keep in house. That's $300 million that's not going into public education, that's going into private pro, uh, uh, pockets. Um, they, they have a huge lobbying um, uh, uh, bank account. Um, they, they, they drill the system. It, within their system are uh, something like 1,500 schools that are not accredited. And, and so if a student goes to one of those schools that's not accredited, they get a, a diploma and they try to go to college or tech school and they're told, sorry, you don't qualify. This, this piece of paper doesn't qualify for admittance. They have to go and get a GED then. So, so there is no regulation on Step Up for Success. There's no regulation on these schools. There's no guarantee that the education that's actually being delivered is an education that student can use to further their life. Why? Why in the world would we allow the transfer of public assets to a product that cannot that cannot actually give a child what a child needs in order to succeed. Why would we do that? What, what kind of human beings are we that uh, we would misuse their trust this way? Reverend Russell Myers, Executive Director of the Florida Council of Churches. We also have Bianca Goolsby, an education advocate with Teaching for the Culture. Let's turn now to education, higher education, public higher ed in Florida. And uh, we have a question here from Bubba, who says, I'm worried about the hostile takeover of New College of Florida. Alumni and students are fighting back. He says, check out savenewcollege.org. So Bianca, your thoughts on New College of Florida and what the governor and the, his administration is, is trying to do there. And is I guess trying is probably not even the right word. They're successfully instituting big changes very quickly. They are doing it. And, and Richard Cochran, which was the commissioner of education, um, is, is right there. I, I mean, you. I hope people are listening. The governor is deciding to make decisions to remove people in office to put who he wants in office against what people believe is right. The governor is making these decisions that are harming our higher institutions, our post-secondary education, all, all, all the way down. And so I hope that the listeners that are listening to this are outraged at what's happening. I hope that they are just not outraged, but do something. Please do something because because we need help and we can't keep just talking about our governor is awful when we had ballots that weren't even turned in when it was election time. So that's why I keep repeating selective outrage and participation. We cannot be outraged what Governor Ron DeSantis is doing when we can't even turn in our ballots to make sure that he's not back in office. So that's my comment. Reverend Meyer. Um. The governor is being uh, advised by um, a small uh, school in the upper uh, Midwest uh, that uh, trumpets white Christian nationalism and is being advised by uh, a, a policy wonk um, out of New York who's decided that uh, a critical race theory um, is is the evil destroying everything, um, and and can't even give an adequate definition of what it is that he's attacking, right? Um, and they want to make new college 
as the white Christian nationalist school of the South, which should be, I, I, I'm a, I, you know, we should call a thing what a thing is. And what this is trying to do is establish a foothold in the Florida public university system of creating a school that, that gives degrees in white supremacy. This is offensive, should be offensive to every Christian, should be offensive to every non-Christian, should be offensive to anybody who uh, treasures the First Amendment about the freedom of religion. We should not be taking a public asset and turning it in to a, 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 a bullhorn for some of the most odious uh, political ideas in our history. Uh, we should call a stop to it. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, 88.5 FM. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Our guests are Russell Meyer, Executive Director of the Florida Council of Churches, and Bianca Goolsby, an education advocate with Teaching for the Culture. So much education stuff to, to, to still talk about. Bianca, let me ask you um, about the AP African American History course. It was taught uh, there at least one school in Florida as a pilot, and then the governor and his uh, administration got really upset at it, and then the college board actually ended up changing it. So what are your thoughts on everything that's happened with, with that course? So it just highlights the bigger issue where we have a governor that can use his political power to alter what is supposed to be taught. I, my comments is directed to College Board at this point because College Board is a nonprofit. They generate a lot of money. The same institution that systemically uses the standardized testing where black and brown children are not able to get access into colleges is the same institution that is um, literally stripping away the teachings of African-American history. So College Board, we are looking to you as people like, what, what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing, College Board? I, I think that there needs to be more governors that speak up about this. There needs to be more legislators that speak up about how a governor can use his political influence to alter a decision of a nonprofit. And why we are having this conversation in this debate still is beyond me, where we still have people intermixing CRT, critical race theory, and it's very adamantly clear that is not taught in our schools. And no matter how many times we frame it, say it, there are going to be people that still think that. And we can't change those decisions. We can't change the minds of those people that are just holding on to misinformation. But what we can do is what we can advocate to ensure that College Board actually gets vetted to ensure that they're actually being a actual nonprofit, that they're conducting business in a way that is above board, that they have accountability, transparency, and integrity in their process. It has to be. So I'm holding College Board accountable at the end of the day because this is the decision that they made. And ultimately, I, with the amount of children that are not able to even have college opportunities and or being placed in advanced placement courses, that is a whole nother conversation. Reverend Dr. Russell Meyer, AP African American history. Well, I would have kept the beta program. I don't think it needed to be changed. Um, but we have to understand in um, in the education publishing business, um, scale and size matters. So there are a lot of things in curriculum that um, get skipped over, get shaved, get shaded based upon uh, volume sales out of Texas and Florida. And so we had some curriculum fights um, previously over school texts. I mean, right now they've rewritten, <clears throat> they've rewritten uh, civics to take the word democracy out of teaching civics. So we've got a lot of problems. And it, it, because it's big dollars, College Board is chasing the dollars, not the truth. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe today, Russell and Bianca. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's good to be with you both. <laughs> Thank you for having us.
Bianca Goolsby is an education advocate with Teaching for the Culture, and Reverend Russell Meyer is Executive Director of the Florida Council of Churches. Thanks to our phone screener, John Dunn. Sorry I didn't get to a couple of those phone calls. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan and at WMNF. Next Tuesday, we'll get an update about efforts to save the USF Forest Preserve. Coming up next is Wavemakers with Jana and Tom. They'll speak with Tampa City Council candidates in District 1. You're listening to WMNF Tampa.